Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. This is going to be more a warning as opposed to a Bible study. There will be some Bible study in here, but it's mostly going to be a warning. Get your King James Bible or Geneva and turn to the book of Titus, chapter 1, starting in verse 12. This is Paul. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. You ever have these people say, Oh, you don't show any love. You don't show any love. You rebuke people. Jesus would never be like that. He loved everybody. Uh, well, yeah, you mean the Jesus that took a whip of cords and beat the money changers out of the table? That Jesus? The one that said, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves? What would Jesus do? Whip of cords. Bible says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. You know what a fable is? It's a story. It's all like a fairy tale. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. We're not to listen to Jewish fables. And that's what Judaism is full of fables, lies. They make this stuff up as they go along. And I'm going to show you some of that from their own website. Verse 15. Under the pure, all things are pure. But under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So we're told... Wherefore, rebuke them sharp, sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed, don't listen, not giving heed to Jewish fables, commandment of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is, is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now, who wrote this? Well, let's take a look. There was a guy named Paul. He's the one that wrote this. So what did Paul... What was, who, who was Paul? Turn to Philippians chapter 3, and verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, it is, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs... Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. What does concision mean? Let's take a look real quick. Concision, concision is a Greek word, 2699 in the New Testament, Greek New Testament. The New Testament was written in Greek. So when the Jews tell you it was originally written in Hebrew, they're, they're lying. But concision means to cut up, to mutilate. Well, it has reference to circumcision. And you know, the uh, Islam, Muslims, have a thing that they do with the women. They do what they call female circumcision. Yeah, if you ask me, that's, that's nowhere in the Bible more stuff being made up. They ruin a woman's pleasure center for sex by doing female, what they call female circumcision. If you ask me, it's barbaric, but that's my opinion. But why is it calling it to cut up mutilation? It has reference to the Jews and their circumcision. Let's take a look. 
All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, well, I guess we'll start in verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling where is, wherein he was called. So, you know, all these little rituals and rules that they had in the Old Testament, faith is far more important than being circumcised. But he says to keep the commandments of God. What commandments? The two commandments. You know, and you got that famous verse in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So how are we supposed to keep the commandments? Well, Jesus says in Matthew 22, verse 35. Well, he's asked a question. He's going to answer it. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Ooh, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You ever hear the Torah observant, the Hebrew roots people ever quote these verses? No. That's why in the book of Titus it says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So, let's take a look at some of the wisdom of the Jews, which is probably what I'm going to name this Bible study warning thing. Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. Now, there's people that will tell you a Pharisee's not a Jew. They're liars. All Pharisees are Jews. Not all Jews are Pharisees, but all Pharisees are Jews. And they came from Jerusalem. Who was living in Jerusalem? Jews. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain other scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with undefiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Now, is it wrong to wash your hands before you eat? No, of course not. Mom taught me that when I was a little, little troublemaker. Now I'm a big troublemaker. But is it a sin not to wash your hands? Well, the Jews said so. They found fault. Verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews... See, it tells you what a Pharisee is right here. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, that's the root word for often, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders, that's what they call the oral law. Oh yeah, God, uh, uh, God, had Moses write the, the written law, the Torah, but then there's the oral law. You know, there's the secret stuff that he didn't have him write down. And if you want to learn that, you got to go to the Jews. We're, we'll teach you the oral law. Pay no heed to Jewish fables. And that's what these, these 
Hebrew roots people, and these Torah keepers, and these messi a lot of these Messianic Jews. I'm not going to tell you all the Messianic Jews are like that, but I tell you what. Every Messianic Jew that I've known, that I've tested, uh, well, there's one group I haven't, I haven't tested yet. But everyone that I have tested have failed the test. I've asked them questions exposing some of the sick practices of Judaism, and they've always lied to me. Always. I just, I just don't get it. Holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. There's nothing wrong with washing cups and pots, but they had turned it into a ritual. Oh, if you want to go to see God, you have to wash this plate first, and then you got to wash that cup next, and then you got to wash this brazen vessel, and then you got to wash the silverware, and you got to do it this order, or God won't accept you. Tradition of the elders. Verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, as to Jesus, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He, Jesus, he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah, that's Isaiah, well hath Isaiah, that's the Greek rendering of Isaiah, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. How dare Jesus call God's chosen people hypocrites? Who does he think he is? If you're a Jew, that's exactly how you feel. Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain. Do you know what vain means? It means something that's worthless. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And I'm going to teach, show you a commandment of, well, a doctrine of devils. I'm going to show you some of that before we're done here. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. They took the commandments of God and put them down and took the commandments of men and lifted them up. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. You ever wonder why Paul said, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth? All right, so let's go back to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you, same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but to you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the B Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. See, Paul saying, oh, you want to brag about being circumcised of the flesh? He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's, that's in the Torah. Of the stock of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. 
But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. You see, all that stuff meant nothing if you don't have Christ. And then you got John Hagee that says, well, you know, Jews, Jews don't need Christ. They got a back door. Well, John Hagee calls Jesus a liar because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Paul basically says the same thing. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Dung is what comes out of the rear end of a cow after she's eaten. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made comfortable, conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So, let's take a look at some of this Jewish fables. Paul writes, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now, these screenshots that I have flipping around are from the Blue Letter Bible. That is a creation of Chuck Missler. He was a founding, uh, he was one of the, well, I don't know, founders, but he was one of the original members of Calvary Chapel. Okay? And when you take a look you're seeing where it talks about the uh, Lilith. I mean, Lilith? Okay. Let's take a look at that. All right. Turn your Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 14. Isaiah is probably the most quoted book in the New Testament. It's been called a mini Bible because... It has, it basically, a lot of it follows very closely, similarly, to the structure of the entire Bible. Now this, this is, uh, if you ask me, this is an end time verse. The trouble with people's understanding of the Bible is they don't read the entire Bible. Because the Bible will give you symbolism in one spot, and then it'll be in a different spot that'll explain what the symbolism means by what is called oftentimes parallelism. For example, you know, we read, uh, for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands. Well, that tells you the Pharisees are Jews. For the Pharisees and all the Jews. See, not all Pharisees uh, I'm sorry, not all Jews were Pharisees. You had the, uh, from history you heard there were, they were Essenes. And then from the Bible there were the Sadducees. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, eh, they were competitors. You know, the, and the Bible explains the difference between them. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Pharisees didn't. I mean, the, the, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, and they didn't believe in angels. The Pharisees did. So, the Sadducees just basically believe the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's it. That's all they believed. They didn't even believe the book of Isaiah. 
So, all right. Uh, I know a lot of times I cover the same material for those of you that are that listen to me on a regular basis, but you got to realize sometimes you, I get a new listener and they're like, well, where did he get that from? You know, so matter of fact, let's take a look real quick. Okay, in Acts 23 and verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. You see, they were sad, you see, because if there's no resurrection, I mean, it's basically eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, so do whatever you want. What kind of a sad religion is this, Sadducees? I mean, they don't believe that they're going to get a new body. What's up with that? I mean, this this life is it. You die, that's it. You go back to the dust. You're recycled into a plant or, you know, a cow eats the plant. I mean, you know, I mean, that's a sad religion. And they, they call themselves Jews. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. See, the Pharisees confess that there is a resurrection and there are angels or spirits. So that's the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But they both consider themselves Jews. All right. Isaiah 34, verse 1. And uh, you might have to, you know, take a look at the that slideshow thing I'm doing. I, I, I don't know how to do... Uh, video editing yet. I've been trying to learn a little bit, but it takes time. So, you know, you might want to take a look at what uh, Chuck Missler's Blue Letter Bible says and what the My Jewish Learning says. So, and take a look. Okay. Isaiah 34 and verse 1. Come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation, indignation is extreme hatred. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. You know that word there, nations, is the same word that the King James sometimes translates as Gentiles? Yeah, it's the same word. But uh, people are... You know, the Jews want us to think that the word Gentiles means non-Jew. Well, this word nations, sometimes it's talking about the heathen nations. Sometimes it's talking about the, the, the 12 nations of Israel, the 12 tribes. Same word does not necessarily mean non-Jew. It can mean non-Jew, but it doesn't always mean non-Jew. I mean, a Ford is always a car. But not all cars are Fords. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Compare that to the second coming in the book of Revelation, where it talks about the blood all the way to the horse's bridle. I mean, that's, that's, that's three, four feet of blood. Verse 3, their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth from the vine, as a falling fig from the fig tree. Didn't I just do a Bible study on fruit where I mentioned the vine and the fig tree? All right, so in Isaiah 34, verse 4, you know, we just read, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth off from, from the vine, and a falling fig from the fig tree. We'll now turn to Revelation chapter 6. This is like a parallel verse. 
Revelation 6 and verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree. Didn't we just read that in Isaiah? Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Didn't we just read that? And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So there's a, you know, people don't get it. There's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament. People think, oh, the Old Testament, you know, it's not worth bothering reading. Yes, it is, people. Yes, it is. Isaiah is a tough book, though. Because sometimes it'll be talking about the future, then it'll talk about the present, then it'll talk about the past, and then it'll go back to the future. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit guiding you, forget it. You will never understand it. All right, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Back to Isaiah. Uh, verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. Uh, I don't want to get. I don't want to get into it deep, but Idumea was the land where Esau, Edom, lives. Lived. And uh, of course, the Black Hebrews say that you white people are Edom, and these verses apply to you. You're those evil Edom Esau people, and if you want to know how God felt about Esau and Edom, you can read in Malachi chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, about how God hated Esau. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. Do you know that the people of Idumea, Esau, Edom, they were called the people of the curse. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. You know, it's interesting, if you look up Esau and Edom, E-D-O-M in the Jewish Encyclopedia, it says that Esau Edom is in modern Jewry today. And I bet you the Prime Minister of the Israelis, I bet you he's one of them. Jesus said, love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, kill all the Palestinians. Who does he follow? Not Christ. Verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. I did a Bible study on unicorns. There's an Asian, black Asian rhinoceros called the Unicornus rhinoceros, rhinoceros. It's Greek, means 
one uni, one horn. The African rhino has two horns, but the Asian rhino has one. And it's even called the unicornus. Rhino is Greek. It meant nose. You ever heard of a, a, a doctor that performed rhinoplasty? Nose. One horned nose. How in the world did a unicorn become a horse with a horn sticking out of its head? Jewish fables, I guess. And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and the land shall be soaked with blood, and the dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. The Lord's vengeance. And the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Recompense means it's payback time, people. And the streams therein thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched day nor night. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it for ever and ever. How long is forever? Forever. From generation to generation? Forever. The Bible also says everlasting, but that they don't use that here. But the comorant and the bittern shall possess it. Comorant's a, a type of bird. Uh, the bittern, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Honestly, I don't know. Might be a type of bird. But I don't want to play with it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in their palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons, an habitation of dragons and a court of owls. Ooh, dragons. So, what do we got for dragons? What are dragons? Well, you know, some people strongly believe that dinosaurs lived with man. And honestly, there's a thing called Angor Wat. A-N-G-O-R two words, W-A-T. They have what looks like a stegosaurus in a relief, uh, a raised carving on this temple. This temple is got to be thousands of years old. No, it's not millions of years old. But uh, the Cambodia has guards with AK-47s. They're communists. And they, you wouldn't want to try to take a, you would not want to try to take a souvenir from that place. They would kill you. It's a big tourist thing. They get people from all over the world. They go visit it. They pay money. And uh, Thailand, which is a constitutional monarchy, and Cambodia, it's right on their border, and they're always fighting over it. But where in the world did um, this Stegosaurus raised relief ra uh, carving, where did they get the idea to do this? If the Earth is millions and billions of years old, and dinosaurs didn't live with man, where did they get the idea for this thing? Huh? Huh? But even if you don't believe the dinosaurs were called dragons, uh, the Bible explains the Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. See, the Bible explains the Bible. If you let it, 
unless of course you want to go run after Jewish wisdom, which I'm going to be showing you some of it pretty soon. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Oh, yeah. All right. Back to Isaiah 34, 13. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court of owls. All right. Let's take a look. Isaiah 34, 14. This is part of the slideshow I've been showing you. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Now, a satyr, according to mythology, is a goat demon. Okay? I mean, the Bible's got some pretty wild descriptions of um, angels in the Bible. I mean, they got one that's got four faces. One a face of a man, face of an ox. Um, I don't remember all the others. You know, but they got some weird, weird looking, you know, there, there's different classes of angels. And some of them are pretty strange looking. So, did some of the strange looking angels, when they were fall from heaven, did they appear to men? Did, is this where the satyr came from? I don't know. I don't think it's that important. But the big thing is the screech owl. That is, in the King James, is translated from the Hebrew word Lilith. So, it's supposed to be a night creature. Well, what's an owl? It's a night creature. They hunt by night. Owls are really kind of interesting. Uh, from what I understand, they don't even make any noise when they fly. They're silent. You know, so when a, when a mouse is being hunted which the owl has excellent night vision. The only thing it does is it feels talons into the back of its neck. And the next thing you know, it's dinner. So, let's take a look at uh, what Chuck Missler has to say. You know, Calvary Chapel, Blue Letter Bible. That's that thing that's been flipping around. All right, when you start looking at this, okay, Lilith, Hebrew word 3915. When you look at the, uh, go to the middle, it says the King James translates this as screech owl. Outline of Bible usage, question mark. Lilith. Name of a female goddess. Is there female goddesses? Known as a night demon who haunts the desolate places of Edom. That's the first one. Second one. Might be a nocturnal animal that inhabits um, desolate places. A night specter. What's a specter? A ghost. So, okay. Okay. So, where's this in the Bible? Lilith, name of a female goddess known as a night demon who haunts the desolate places of Edom. Uh, where's that in the Bible? Um, it's not. Pay no heed to Jewish fables. Titus, that's where Calvary Chapel's original member, Chuck, Missler got that from he didn't get that from the Bible he got that from Jewish magic and Talmud and Kabbalah and all that other garbage all right let's take a look at my Jewish wisdom my Jewish learning article on Lilith uh, by 
Rabbi Jill Hammer. Ooh. Lilith, Lady Flying in Darkness, the most notorious demon of Jewish tradition, becomes a feminist hero. Lilith is the most notorious demon in Jewish tradition. I'm not even going to try to do a woman's voice. Uh, in some sources, she is conceived as the original woman, created even before Le Eve. And according to those stupid re uh, um, traditions, those legends, Jewish wisdom, Jewish fables, uh, God created Lilith and Adam at the same time or whatever. And when it came time for marital relations in the bedroom, if you know what I'm talking about, she didn't want to be on the bottom so she got all upset and she ran off and she became the wife of, she left Adam. And then she became the wife of Samael, which is like, depending upon who you listen to, Samael is either Satan himself or one of Satan's generals. Take your pick. Where's that in the Bible? Pay no heed to Jewish fables. That's where it's in the Bible. And she is presented as a thief of newborn infants. Lilith means the night. And she embodies the emotional and spiritual aspects of darkness, terror, sensuality, and unbridled freedom. What is unbridled feet of freedom? That means go out and have sex with whoever you want to. More recently, she has come to represent the freedom of feminist women who long, no longer want to be good girls. Biblical and Talmudic tales of Lilith. Now, she's not in the Bible. She's only in the, the Talmud. That's where she's at. All right, so I had to split the article in two because guess what? It was too small to read. Uh, let's see. So Lilith made her way into Israelite tradition. No, she didn't. And uh, she's a spirit of darkness, but a figure of uncontrolled sexuality, according to the Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat 151a, which says it is forbidden for a man to sleep alone in a house, lest Lilith get a hold of him. Lilith is said to fertilize herself with male sperm to give birth to other demons. Where's that in the Bible? It's not. Um, yeah, so... When a man has an issue of sperm, you know, young guys, uh, when they wake up and there's sperm or whatever, Lilith was playing with them and getting them to whatever, give her some sperm so she can make more, have more demon babies. This is the wisdom of the Jews. Isn't this wonderful? Where does this garbage come from? The devil. That's where it comes from, people. It comes from the devil. So, you know, there's a reason why Paul said, pay no heed, don't listen. Pay no heed to Jewish fables. And yet Chuck Missler uses that very, he learned that from Jewish sources. He didn't learn that from the Bible when he says that, you know, Lilith is the night, the night demon or whatever. You know, where did he get this stuff? A female goddess known as a night demon who haunts the desolate places of Edom. And you know what, people? A female goddess. Um, this is exactly where they get the garbage for the Shekinah, the glory S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H, the she kinda. It's it comes from the same place. Jewish mysticism. Well, it's not mysticism, it's magic. Used to be you could call it the occult, but the occult meant hidden. Well, it's not hidden anymore. It's out in the open. Matter of fact, I liked when the uh, sodomites used to be in their closet, and that was occult. That was hidden. Well, they're not in the closet anymore. They're in your face. And the same thing with this, this Jewish garbage. 
And that's what it is. It's garbage. It's the traditions of men, the commandments of men. They make this stuff of the, up as they go along. And, and Christians are running to this stuff. This, this Messianic Jews and, and the Hebrew roots and the Torah keepers and all this other stuff. And yeah, they'll teach you some good stuff out of the Bible, but before long, if you're not careful, they'll be telling you stuff out of the Talmud. Ah, oh, the Shekinah glory. Yeah, the Shekinah glory. You can read about that in the book of Ezekiel, I believe. She was called the Queen of Heaven that the Jews were worshiping. Uh, let's see. Matter of fact, uh, Passover Easter is coming up. Uh, people, keep an eye on your kids, your young children. The uh, three largest times when kidnappings occur is Easter Passover air time, Halloween, and Christmas time, as the secular world calls it. That's when a large number of kidnappings occur. I've heard it said that 50% of the kidnappings occur the two, three weeks prior to those three uh, events. Child sacrifices. Oh, in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 8, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. The queen of heaven. You know, the, the Catholics call her Mary. But she was called Ishtar. She was called Easter. Um, Lilith. To some people, the witches, the Wiccans, love Lilith. They, she is absolutely her, their, their, their goddess. Uh, the Shekinah is is the queen of heaven. God the Father and the Shekinah. Um, let's just say God the Father got the Shekinah goddess pregnant. And she had a son that they call Yeshua. Yeah. This is the, pay no heed to Jewish fables. Jeremiah 7, 18. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle a fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, plural, gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Does God sound like he's happy they're making cakes to the queen of heaven? No. So let's take a look at uh, Jeremiah 44, 25. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we may, that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, Ye shall surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. In other words, you made a promise, you've done it, you said it with your mouth, you've done it with your hands. God's gonna let them do. But as 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 uh, Jeremiah seven eighteen said, to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Oh yeah, you want to you want to worship Satan? God will let you. But if you hear that word Lilith, know what it's all about. And by the way, Stevie Nicks. Oh, I can't remember the group she used to play with. Uh, hold on, I gotta look it up. Yeah, Stevie Nicks was with Fleetwood Mac. She was big in the '70s and the '80s. Yeah, I'm showing my age. But uh, she used to um, say that her concerts, well, she would dedicate her concerts to all the Wiccans of the world, and I believe Lilith and, you know, that whole, that whole scene. So, you know, 
when you're talking about entertainers and all this stuff, you're talking heavy duty in your face Satanism. But, you know, the average Christian doesn't know any of this stuff. Me, I spent a year studying the occult. I was an idiot, I guess. But but I wanted to, to know, if I knew what the occult was all about, I knew that I would recognize it in the church. You know, um, what was it? Um, Frazier's girlfriend on um, Cheers. What was her name? Lilith Stern, a nice Jewish girl. Stern, that's a Jewish name. You know, Howard Stern. Lilith Stern. You know, they they put the stuff in your face and everybody laughs. They think, oh, it, ha, 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 that was a funny joke. It, it's It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And and these and these Christians and stuff, they think they're going to fly away out of here any second. God's not going to take them anywhere. So, what can I tell you? And oh, by the way, if uh, um well, just know that if you're white, you're a racist. Remember that, people. All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.